Welcome to the Unabridged Podcast. I'm Ashley. And this is Jen. Join us for bookish episodes and check out our website, unabridgedpod.com, where you can find lots of new bookish content to grow your TBR. Sign up for our newsletter to find out more about online book discussions and upcoming events. Find us on Patreon for extra unabridged content. Join us on Instagram and Facebook at Unabridged Pod and message us there or see our website to get plugged into the Unabridged community. You want opinions about books? We've got them. Hi, and welcome to Unabridged. This is episode 252. Today, we are talking about Ruth Reichel's Save Me the Plums, which is our April 2023 book club. Before we get started today, I just want to remind you that we are continuing our Patreon campaign. We are loving doing those exclusive episodes every month, and we've done a lot of adaptations, which are really fun, but we also give behind-the-scenes peeks and into kind of how we choose books and things like that, and then we also have some other topics we've enjoyed covering. So be sure to, to hop over to patreon.com slash unabridgedpod if you'd like to support us. There's a lot of different ways to do that, and Just so you know, we also don't mind if you just want to support us for a month just so that you can say, hey, I support you, and you don't want to hang out in there because another subscription is quite a burden. We both get that. Mm -hmm. So please don't feel bad if you want to just pop on and support us and then cancel. That will not hurt our feelings. We tried to put tears in there so that people could do that. It was just an easy way. There are some other platforms for kind of a you know, buy us a cup of coffee kind of things. But right now, we're just sticking with the one. We want to make sure there's content on there for people who want it. But if you're looking for a way to support us, we do appreciate that so much. Before we get into our book club pick, we wanted to share our bookish check-in. Jen, what's something you're reading? So I am reading Rachel Cohen's Austin Years, a memoir in five novels. And this is part of my year two, year long buddy read. This is Read Austin 23. So last year, I went through Austin's six major novels. And then this year, I'm doing other buddy reads for things that are Austin related. So some biographies, some retellings. This one is... Cohen's really beautifully written reflective memoir. She begins it when she has a lot of things going on, including the death of her father and the birth of her first child. And she really turns to Austin as this way to reflect. She says there are a few years when Austin is the only thing she's reading and she is just reading and rereading five of her novels. So she doesn't talk about Northanger Abbey as much. That's the one of her major novels she leaves out. But these become sort of sounding boards for her to consider her life and to reflect on what she has going on. She talks about how some of the books are clearly about grief and really resonate with Cohen as she is working through the death of her father, who was... A, he was a professor, not of English, but he was constantly pondering ideas that, again, she just feels really re- resonate with Austin's book. So the way she approaches it is not like, here's a chapter about sense and sensibility. Here's a chapter about Pride and Prejudice. It's more woven together, these different threads. So she'll, she will have deep dives into particular novels But then she also circles back to them over and over. I'm about halfway through. And I found it to be a really rewarding reading experience since I have so recently read Austin's books to just see this other angle on them. I do think they're books that you read differently at different points in your life. And because when I read them, I was at a very different place from Cohen. It's interesting to see the way they're reflecting back different parts of herself. It's almost a book that you can read very leisurely. I've taken, you know, it'll be a full month of me reading this memoir, which is not all that long. And I think that's about right. I think it's one that I've been enjoying dipping into periodically in the way that she's talking about reading Austin. So yeah, it's this really kind of meta experience. It's been really cool. Parts of it are very sad. Parts of it are really beautiful. The consideration of Austin's own life is in there as well. And since I just read her biography, that's hitting some notes I didn't expect. So yeah, it's really cool. So that's Rachel Cohen's Austin Years, a memoir in five novels. Oh, wow, Jen. I hadn't heard anything about that. That's really... Interesting. It reminds me a little bit of, did you read the Toni Morrison book club? Yes. 
Mm-hmm. So that one's a group memoir, and it has a lot of authors, so I won't list them all right now. But I really enjoyed that as an exploration of an author I really loved and some of their works, and then how those connect personally to the people telling the story. So I kept thinking yes. about that when you were talking about Cohen. But I, I love seeing that, like seeing the way that really powerful literature impacts someone and then reading about it. I think that's always fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it it does feel different from that one. But yes, that that part is similar. And just seeing Yeah, I love seeing people highlight connections that maybe I don't have, you know, they have a different life experience from me. So it really highlights the richness of great, great books. Yeah. How about you, Ashley? What are you reading? So one of the ones I'm reading right now is Akwai Kia Maisie's You Made a Fool of Death with Your Beauty. So we've talked about Amazie on the podcast before. I know Jen and I both love their books, and I'm always interested to see what they do with the stories. And this one is no exception. I was sucked in right away. It has a very captivating and not PG beginning. (laughs) And so right away, the opening scene is just like... Right, right there in your in your <laughs> in your face, and it's a very passionate encounter, you know. So you find out that this is Faye, and she is a young woman. She's probably I'm. They might say her age, and maybe I'm, I'm not remembering, but you know, she's probably around thirty or late twenties, and she is reeling from the loss of her beloved partner who died five years prior in a car accident. So it's really her story of what I've seen so far is just that it's her story of trying to get back out there in her life. She's always quoting her therapist who is like, you know, you are here and you are alive. And so she's really trying to stop living in this past. She, yeah, a lot of, I mean, a lot of it is really beautiful. It's about grief and how not only do we lose the person we love, but we also like have a past self that that self is also gone. And that that kind of loss kind of cuts your life in two. And so, you know, it's been five years. And so her, she has this phenomenal friend, Joy. And Joy has been trying to get her back out there in her life and just get her to kind of live again. And so that's why there's this opening scene that is fun for the reader, but also kind of shows her being like, I am going to do things differently. And I'm going to get back out there. And I'm going to try to find my way in the world as someone who is here and alive. And so as she's making this journey, she's also she is an artist and she's extremely talented, but she also is so caught in her grief that she is maybe not promoting her work as much. Or I mean, as we all know, young artists who are really talented, it's extremely difficult to be discovered. And so even though she's clearly super talented, she's also she has a lot of money from her husband's death. And so she's like able to not, you know, she can work and she has this money, but she also feels a lot of guilt related to that. So you kind of see her working her way through and she winds up in this situation where she gets offered an opportunity to show her work. And so things kind of evolve from there with her art. And then, and I think this is what Amazie does that I find so fascinating. She winds up, and I'm not going to give any spoilers, but she just winds up in this really difficult morality situation of like, what do I do? What's the right thing to do? Should I do what is going to make me happy? And like that happened. And I think that that is even though each work I've read of Amazie's have been very unique from each other. This is my third that I've read of their work. And I feel like each one is very unique. But I think that the thing that I find striking about each one is there's a lot of questions of what is the right thing to do and characters get put in these really difficult situations and then have to navigate their way through them. And so that's what you see with Faye in this that I think is kind of at the center. And again, I don't want to say what the thing is because I don't want to give any spoilers, but I do think, I mean, I'm just really captivated and I think that it looks a lot at grief. I think it looks a lot at how we become successful and also at relationships and what you are willing to sacrifice in order to have a meaningful relationship and like what that looks like. So yeah, I think it's great. Um, and so I've, I'm a little ways in and I can't wait to see what happens. But this is 
Akwaiki and Maisie's You Made a Fool of Death with Your Beauty. I really want to read that. such a great title. It has the most beautiful cover as well. It does. So, the yes. title and the cover uh-huh. are both like striking. Yes. And there is an island scenic aspect for a lot of it as well that is fantastic. Oh, nice. And there's a lot of food if people are into food descriptions and stuff like that. Like we're talking about Reichel's work today. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of that too that's just really lovely and interesting. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Moving right along, we are going to talk today about Ruth Reichel's Save Me the Plums. And this one, I'm going to read a quick synopsis extracted from the publisher's synopsis. Trailblazing food writer and beloved restaurant critic Ruth Reichel took the job and the risk of a lifetime when she entered the glamorous, high-stakes world of magazine publishing. Now, for the first time, she chronicles her groundbreaking tenure as editor-in-chief of Gourmet, during which she spearheaded a revolution in the way we think about food. When Condé Nast offered Ruth Reichel the top position at America's oldest Epicurean magazine, she declined. She was a writer, not a manager, and had no inclination to be anyone's boss. And yet, Reichel had been reading Gourmet since she was eight. It had inspired her career. How could she say no? And so from there, we really find out so much about her getting to gourmet and then also what it was like while she was there so yeah we're gonna be discussing that today so we're gonna dive right in with overall impressions jen what was your overall impression i really like this one so this is the second of rachel's memoirs that i've read the first tender at the bone i think i liked a little bit more you got it a taste and that i just realized as i was saying it that that would be punny but a taste of that book in the parts in this one where she talked about her parents and her family and the way that they had influenced her decision to make food her career. But overall, I really like this one. So I think that anytime you're reading a book centered on food, the descriptions are so vivid. And I listened to this one on audio and Rachel reads it herself. And I just love hearing her write that sensory language is so strong. And when she describes what something looks like or tastes like or smells like, I just feel like it's so visceral. And so I really love those parts of it. I also am quite interested in this sort of move away from print magazines. And I'm going to talk about this is a slight digression, but I have subscribed to Entertainment Weekly since I was in college. It is one of my favorite magazines. I love pop culture. And I think it was last year they stopped publishing print magazines. And so when she was talking about the decision not to publish Gourmet, I felt a similar sadness because I do think there's something about the way that magazines can promote journalists and about the quality of work that like the the movie reviews in Entertainment Weekly were excellent. They still have an online presence, but I feel like it's not the same. And so, yeah, when she was writing about those, I kept thinking about EW and how sad I am that it's no longer in print. And so I do think when you have something like Gourmet was for her, that's been a touchstone, not just the part that it was her job, but it was, it represented something else for her that really resonated for me. So yeah, overall, I liked it. I wouldn't say even of the two I've read of hers, that it was my favorite of hers, but I thought there was a lot to think about. And I appreciated that. what do you think, Ashley? What were your overall impressions? What I loved the most was the description of food and the way that really powerful food experiences heighten our existence. I thought all that was really beautiful. And so I loved that. I was interested. Like you said, Jen, I think I have thought, I think like a lot of people who were born in the time period that Jen and I were born in, (laughs) who are living through the technology era of today. I think I do think a lot about the end of an era and the things that we had that we're moving away from. And some of those I think are good. And some of them hurt my heart. You know, I think in the book world, we think a lot about like print books and a lot of that same thing with magazines is relevant. Now we're looking at it with the audiobook world and narrators and the integration of AI and how that can change the role of humans in creation. So I just think, and same with copywriting, frankly, you know, with print, I mean, even on the digital space. So I just think, you know, we're always thinking about those aspects. And I thought that was really interesting. I also really enjoyed 
seeing how she personally and the magazine as a group went through certain things like like 9-11, you know, and how they handled that and distributed food. And so I, I appreciated the way that she incorporated both her personal experiences and also just like movement through time of historical events that we're all familiar with and how that impacted the magazine, like the recession and how that led to, you know, where we wind up where gourmet is no longer being published. So I just felt like I thought all that was really interesting. I would say that I liked it, but did not necessarily love it. I definitely want to read tender at the bone. I think that part of what I didn't love was exactly what Reichel felt about gourmet in the sense that some of just the decadence was off-putting to me. And I think that she was just showing what is true about corporate companies who have endless dollars and who live extremely luxurious lives and create that for their employees or some of their employees as we see in there. And so I felt like that was off-putting. So I think it wasn't her writing that was off-putting, but I did find that that part impacted me as a reader just because I was like, man, you know, why does why does writing about food have to be that way? Um, and so, you know, I think that that was part of my overall experience was just that I was like, eh. I mean, you know, the, I mean, again, she's just showing how people were, but about things like not, you know, they, how are you really going to fly coach? Like stuff like that, that I'm like, oh my gosh, come mm-hmm. on. This is just crazy. And if they had just made some of those changes, then like they could have kept getting in the magazine. But again, it just shows what was valued and not valued. And I think she does a good job of depicting that, of like how they'd rather cut the magazine than make those changes to lifestyle yeah. that would have made it possible to continue. So. Well, and you can see how easily, how easy it is for her to get pulled into it, even though oh, yeah. they're at the beginning, you know, she's still taking the subway to work and everyone's appalled, but then she realizes, okay, then here's this driver who it isn't having work. And so she feels like she was taking a stand but but then what is the imp- yeah i i thought some of those little moral quandaries were really interesting and i also think just you know one of her goals she she talks about when she is talking about why she doesn't like gourmet at, you know where there's that period where she becomes disenchanted with it it's because they are focused on experiences that are not available to most people and that is one of her stated goals is to have writing about restaurants and food that are accessible to most people. And yet, even though that's her goal and she does in many ways achieve it, she is also pulled into this really, like you said, decadent, I think is a great word. Yeah. So it's interesting. All of those internal contradictions I did think were fascinating to think about. And there's not an easy resolution for any of it, which I think is as it should be, because I don't think there's an easy answer. But yeah, that is really fascinating. Yeah. So what was one thing particularly that worked for you, Jen? I really liked the focus on the creative process and collaboration. When she was talking about putting together teams who worked well together and You know, often she would have these people in different roles who were polar opposites and would completely disagree and how rich that disagreement was for making the magazine better. I just thought a lot of that really echoed my experiences and this knowledge that you need different types of people and that when you're a good manager, which, you know, again, she did not see herself as a manager when she moved into this job. But she quickly realized the value of having people who came at problems from different angles. So she had some people who were, she described as being chaotic and really creative and just sort of overflowing with ideas that were impractical. And then she would have people who were much more, I can't remember the term she used, but you know, they were the people who kind of kept things running and who were more practical and were trying to anchor them in the real And her job was to synthesize those two different points of view. And I think the times when that's allowed to happen are the times when you see the magazine really taking off and making some real changes and having some forward momentum. And then when you get too many people who think alike, 
<laughs> it's a big problem. And I think she just has this really interesting way as well of having conversations that she learns from, you know, when she talks about Cy, who is such an interesting, I was going to say he's a real person, but character, he is also a character through the book. And he just seems so erratic. And yet she is able to learn from him, even though she quite clearly disagrees with a lot of his decisions and the times that she doesn't allow herself to learn from the people she's meeting are the times she regrets the most. So yeah, I just think that whole, I'm fascinated by books that focus on creative processes and on collaboration and on team building, even though that's not necessarily the explicit intention of this book. I, I really enjoy those parts of it. Sorry, that was a bit of a ramble, but <laughs> I was working my way around to that one a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really fascinating also in the way that, and I think what we see too I don't think this is her intention, but I think we see Reichel as such a great leader. Mm -hmm. And I think it's exactly because she wasn't there to manage. Yes. And she wasn't trying to clean house. And she wasn't going to intimidate people and make people feel afraid. And that that is what makes her so valuable and successful. And it makes people willing to take the risk and to try new things and to push the envelope. And they only can do that because they feel this space and support. And so like, I really appreciated that. Yeah, I think she's really great at finding people's strengths. You know, every time someone would come in and propose a new way to do photography, and to or to lay out the pages. Yeah, I, I those make me happy. How about you, Ashley? What's one thing that worked for you? So a section I really loved, which is consistent with what I criticized about the just decadence of gourmet. I loved the shoestring budget uh-huh. Paris trip. And I think it's because she felt nostalgic and I felt my own nostalgia <laughs> through her depiction of just that was resonant with experiences I had as a young adult and just making it work. I mean, I, you know, would eat, I mean, same like baguettes. I had packed these like power bars, you know, on some of my trips and would like live off of those <laughs> in my backpack before and, you know, try to save up for the $5 meal that you found somewhere. And same with like trying to find a place to stay that was a reasonable price. And I mean, I definitely stayed single dollar places that I would like prop up things against the door because it literally was not I mean, now I would never I would never consider doing some of that. But at the time, it was like, oh, I'll just stick something <laughs> under the door. It's fine. It'll be fine. And, you know, and so I think I just felt this intense nostalgia for a simpler way to be and to travel. And I think we see that in her going. And I also, the reason I thought that that section of the book was really powerful is just that reminder that when there are hard times like a recession, or certainly we cert- we have seen this recently with the pandemic, that like there are these silver linings and you can, especially when you're thinking in creative ways, discover something that would have gone undiscovered. And I particularly loved, I thought it was kind of odd to include at first, but I loved the part about the dress uh-huh. and the Severine that she encountered the husband of the dress and that he'd lost his wife. And I mean, I kind of, I, I questioned whether that like really happened as is, or if that was something that she wove into the story. But either way, it absolutely worked for me because I just thought exactly what she says about, you know, that you can only enjoy those luxurious. I mean, she talks about that one restaurant and says it would not have been this like phenomenal heavenly experience if I had gone to this three-star Michelin yeah. restaurant the night before. And I thought like, yes, like that's it is those things are amazing, but they're only amazing when they don't happen every day right. and every meal. And that that's part of the joy. And I think that's what she does with gourmet is just like elevates that experience and finds a way to connect to kind of day-to-day life for people, but also present these like above and beyond recipes or covers or stories that really impact people. Mm -hmm. So yes, mom was kind of roundabout too. But yeah, I really those were some things that worked really well for me. Yeah, one of the quotations I wrote down, which I won't use now, but was when 
the man that she sees twice, right? She sees him in the dress and then later in the shoestring budget trip. When you attain my age, you will understand one of life's greatest secrets. Luxury is best appreciated in small portions. When it becomes routine, it loses its allure. And yeah, exactly what you just said. I just think that encompasses so much. And then you see too, the luxury and the comfort that food can add. I was glad you mentioned the 9-11 part because I thought when they were making food for the firefighters and... That food became such a way of reaching out to someone else and to offering comfort and that, yeah, you see that really sort of emerge in that section that food can mean so many different things depending on context. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that quote. Yeah. That, like I said, that whole part just worked really well for me. And then again, those, I just think that shows her such a great storyteller. And so that's another reason that I would definitely read more of her work Mm -hmm. because, she does such a good job of pulling out the threads that make the stories so interesting. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, we are going to, Jen just shared a quick, not quote, quote. <laughs> that <laughs> one I'm didn't glad count. you did. Because I, I love that one. But what, what is another quote that you'd like to share? All right. Well, I'm going to share this one. It is about David Foster Wallace, who I think we just need to acknowledge. There have been some things that have come out about him that he was abusive. And yeah, so during those parts, there are some authors that she mentions whose work I have enjoyed in the past, but I did cringe a little bit because we've since found out some things about them. But anyway, she's talking about the risk, the, the risk of publishing that piece he wrote about the lobster. And she says, I had nightmares about every one of those pieces. But in those sleepless nights, while we were editing the David Foster Wallace piece, I'd learned an important lesson. When something frightens me, it is definitely worth doing. And I will say that is something I have trouble with in my own life. I'm definitely not a risk taker and I approach life very cautiously. And yet the times that I have taken a risk, I have been glad that I did. And so I think seeing her find that lesson over and over again is that reminder that it's not something you do just once, but that you have to take risks. You know, taking the job at Gourmet was a risk. And then when the magazine closes, she has to take a different kind of risk with herself and with what her goals are. And of course, within her running of the magazine, uh, we see her taking risks over and over. So I really, I I liked that part. I felt like that was kind of a personal challenge to me. (laughs) Yes, I thought I loved that too. Again, I think she had quite a few just really beautiful passages that did such a nice job of summarizing the connection between the experience and the way that it impacted her as a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Ashley? What was your quote? I thought there were a lot that stood out to me, but this is about her personal life. And so in some ways, I think that that actually is kind of the backstage of this particular book, but it was really interesting to me. So this is a time where she had to go somewhere and her husband also had something. And so he was like trying to figure out what they were going to do about their son And he basically says, who will take care of him while you're away? (laughs) And so this is the quote. And she says, rage had overwhelmed me while I was away. What about him? The feeling was as familiar as a toothache. Things may be better now, although I have my doubts. But in 1999, when a child got sick at school, the nurse never called the father. Working men did what was convenient. Working women did everything else. And felt constantly guilty. No matter where you were, it always felt like the wrong place. Later, when young editors came to tell me they were pregnant but planned to keep it working, I'd find myself warning them about the guilt to come. Because all the talk about quality time is utter nonsense. Children don't need quality time. They need your time. Lots of it. And they let you know it. And I just felt like, as a working mom, and I think, you know, probably every working mom out there that read that passage was just like, that's exactly it. I mean, that's exactly it. And I have a very supportive life partner, and it has no criticism. I think her partner in the book is very supportive. But that guilt, to me, seems unique to moms, at least in my own experience, of no matter what thing you're doing, you feel guilty that you're not doing the other thing. And there's no way to do it all. And yet you are having to do it all all the time. And so that just was really resonant to me. And I think that, again, while that might have been kind of the back burner of (laughs) this is ripe for puns. Yes, the puns proliferate. It's okay. As long as we acknowledge them, it's okay. Oh, my goodness. Anyway, so, you know, while that might have been not the center of the story, it is definitely an integral part of her experience as a restaurant critic. I mean, it comes up over and over again. We feel her guilt of having been gone for so much of her child's young childhood because she always had to eat out for dinner. 
and how that impacted them. And so, you know, we see it. And then here, I just thought like, yeah, that, that's exactly it. It's just this feeling of you should do these things for your work. And, you know, I think that we want to be ambitious in our careers. And yeah, and then maybe every woman doesn't, but women who do, I think you can't get away from this feeling of that ambition is always tempered by the guilt that you feel for being away from your family. And so, You know, I just, that really stood out to me. It was something that when I was thinking back at the end of the book, that was a passage that had really resonated that I wanted to share. Mm -hmm. Yes. I I was standing in my kitchen, not cooking because I don't cook, which I guess I should have acknowledged earlier in this episode. I think people who've listened for a while know. So there's that (laughs) irony. But anyway, standing in my kitchen and I was like, oh my goodness. Yes. And again, my husband participates actively I mean, again, he's the one who does the cooking and the grocery shopping. And so, but yeah, it's still that expectation and the way things are seen from the outside and our own expectations for ourselves and where we feel that we fall short over and over again. Yes. Yes. And I think, yeah, (laughs) I think later, like when we see her son going off to college and she's like regretting all that time. Oh my gosh. I mean, I think it's exactly that. And I think... Some of that is being a parent. And I mean, say, I should say, I don't cook either. And I did cook, but I have not cooked really since my children were born. So my partner does all the cooking. He's a phenomenal chef. And so that's relevant in our discussion of this. But I do think that that feeling of trying to do all the things and feeling like, and again, maybe it's all self-imposed, but feeling like you're not able to do any of them Mm -hmm. as well as you should, I think is really striking. Yeah. All right. Well, we wanted to share a pairing And um, I will say, I personally realized that I had not read many things that were like this. So when I was thinking about pairings, I was like, gosh, I really haven't read many things. I've read a lot of memoirs, but not many that center on food in this way. I think I've read some other memoirs that where food is really important, but not so much a journey through a work experience. So I have a pick, but maybe loosely, (laughs) loosely a pairing. But Jen, what's your pick for a pairing? So mine is Stanley Tucci's Taste My Life Through Food, which I will say you absolutely have to listen to. So Tucci, if you're not familiar, is an amazing actor and he narrates this himself and brings to bear all of his talents as an actor in sharing his story. And this is another one that blends Stories about his life, about his family, about his work on a lot of movies that include food. So he's in Big Night, which takes place in an Italian restaurant. And he was in Julie and Julia. He plays Julia Child's husband. And so he has all of these great work experiences. But then he is also an accomplished chef. And he talks about particular dishes that mean a lot to him and exactly how to make them. And again, like I was saying earlier about Reichel, he just has this ability to describe the way things feel and smell and taste and look. And he brings all of his senses in these beautiful descriptions of food and of particular drinks that he makes. And so it becomes this really visceral listening experience. I, I absolutely love this memoir. I love him and his approach to life. And parts of it are quite funny and parts of it are sad. And all of it is anchored in these in these moments with food that you can see how his life sort of centers and swirls around them. So yeah, that's Stanley Tucci's Taste My Life Through Food. It is a phenomenal reading experience. I will have to check that one out, Jen. That sounds great. Oh, you would love it. You would love it so much. Thinking about Reichel's recipes, especially the noodle dish, but all of them. I mean, I totally bookmarked those and am very interested in trying them. So I do think there's something really powerful about reading someone's experience and then them telling you a recipe yeah. and how that can be really meaningful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about you? What's your pairing? So I wanted to share Kim Fay's Love and Saffron, a novel of friendship food, and love. And we recently talked about historical fiction. This would be a good one for historical fiction as well. And um, this one is largely letters. So it's epistolary. And it's been a while since I read it. But I wanted to share it because it centers food and how food can connect people. And so this one centers on two women. Joan is a young woman. She's 27. And she writes a fan letter to Imogen, who is 59. And they 
she sends the letter with Saffron in the letter, and that catches Imogen's attention, and Imogen writes her back, and they come to know each other and become dear friends through this correspondence and sharing their love of food, and they also are writing, this is in the 60s, and so it's during, it's kind of leading up to and then during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and so you know, there's a lot going on and the world is really unstable. And yet they have this, what comes to be a really great friendship, where they are kind of anchoring each other amid this chaotic time period. And I think what strikes me and why I think it's relevant to this is just this idea of how food is an essential part of being human. And A love of food can really anchor us to people, and sharing that is a way to come to know other people and come to love them and really understand them. And so, again, it is different in a lot of ways from this. I realized, like I said, when I I thought about memoirs to pair, there were some that came to my mind, but a lot of them were so different, even if they had a lot to do with food, it still felt so different in tone and purpose. And so this one, I feel like, is more about, like, how the love of food really connects us as people. And so I think it's a good pick for that reason. It is a quick read, and it's really lovely. And so, again, that one is called um, Love and Saffron, and it's by Kim Fay. That one's been on my list. I feel like, yeah, we've talked about it on the podcast before, and so it's been on my list for a while. Yeah, Sarah shared it. Yeah, I can't remember what which episode Sarah shared it for, but Sarah shared it, and right away I was like, oh, I want to read that. So um, yeah, it's a great read. All right, we wanted to wrap up our discussion with our bookish hearts. Jen, how many bookish hearts? I think four for me. I liked it, but again, I think I prefer her other memoir. And so yeah, there are a lot of things to appreciate, but four. How about you? Yep, I'd say four for me too. All right. Well, we want to end today with our Give Me One. And today's topic is favorite birthday cakes. We are <laughs> we're sticking with the food theme. Jen, what is your favorite birthday cake? So my personal favorite is one that my mom makes for me every year. And it is a homemade white cake with almond flavoring. And then she makes this delicious icing and has coconut on it, which I will say neither my husband nor my sons likes coconut. So since that all came about, mom makes half of it with coconut and then leaves the other half without coconut, which I just think is horrible, but then they will eat it. So I don't have the whole cake (laughs) to eat by myself. But yeah, my mom's made that for me since I was little. So there's a lot of nostalgia there and it's just delicious. How about you? I think my personal favorite is cookie cake. So I really like the ones that are like a chocolate chip cookie, but it is the whole cake. So I think if I just chose by, there are a few desserts we consistently use for birthdays and that that's not one we've ever made from home. We should try that sometime, but that's one we would buy instead. So that in some ways isn't always my favorite in that regard. Yeah. But if I'm just going for taste, I really love cookie cake. That's just like a chocolate chip cookie. Oh, Those are icing. good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you like it? They're so sweet. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> they are. A little bit goes a long way, mm-hmm. but yeah, they're good. Well, we hope you enjoyed our discussion of Ruth Reichel's Save Me the Plums. Thanks to everybody who joined us for the book club discussion of that one. And we look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks for listening. Do you have comments or opinions about what you heard today? We'd love to hear them. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Unabridged Pod or on the web at unabridgedpod.com for ways to support us. To get more involved, you can sign up for our newsletter, join a buddy read, or become an ambassador. Thanks for listening to Unabridged.